Welcome to Metamorphosis and part three on historic newspapers on microfilm. We've covered a great deal to this point, but there are a few more things to consider before we're ready to digitize. Let's look at evaluating the film as a physical object. You may or may not have access to your master microfilm. If you don't, you might have a second, third, or fourth generation print master. Or maybe you only have a positive copy. You can collate any of these derivatives provided they are exact replicas of the print master negative that you're required to scan per the Indian P-Spec. That said, it's handy to evaluate the master negative because you might discover physical defects that decide whether or not you digitize a reel or even a title. Advanced redox, silvering, scratches, or emulsion separating from the film base can render your text virtually unreadable. Cleaning the film won't help redox and silvering, but duplication can sometimes lessen the effects if it's caught early enough. On the other hand, there's no fixing deep scratches or emulsion separation. If any one of these defects is bad enough, the worst case scenario might be that the title you want is only on one reel and that reel is illegible, making digitization pointless. The best case scenario is that you discover the problem while the text is still legible and make a print master to save the information. There are less drastic physical ailments as well, such as brittle or torn film. These reels might appear a total loss, but they don't always have to be. Provided they survive duplication, most of the reel can be saved by simply creating a print master, uh, though you may only have one chance to make it. Adhesive glues that smear can adversely affect your film's images. Weak splices can break or create a sort of speed bump during duplication that will blur images. Weak and bumpy splices can be replaced. Dirt and adhesive glue can be removed. A thorough exam and cleaning of the master prior to duplication will help keep the master's integrity intact and produce the best print masters. Stains, mold, and odor, most likely a result of vinegar syndrome, can affect your master microfilm. Rarely are stains and mold bad enough to ruin the images, but the extent of these damages can mandate a replacement master. The last thing you want to do is put such reels back into your collection. After all this, if you only have a print master or positive at the ready, you can still use it for collation. Just beware if it's a service copy. Service microfilm takes a lot of abuse. It can be badly scratched in no time with all manner of <clears throat> stuff ground into it. If that's the case, you'll have to find out which generation is actually compromised, and that isn't always apparent. The problem may actually be on the master. So practice and learn to recognize the characteristics of both the master and the copy so that you can make the most informed decision possible. This could make the difference in the quality of your digital images and your OCR accuracy. Now, let's look at some intellectual aspects of the newspapers. It isn't just completeness that we're after, but we need to collect other important information too. Some of that information you'll need for your NDNP metadata. Other information you may use later, for instance, as you write your historical essay or perhaps choose other titles for digitization. Understanding each title, its relationship to other titles where applicable, and its LCCN is key to everything else you do. You can get a lot of this information from the title's mark record. There are a few fields we're particularly interested in, starting with the 010 field for the LCCN. This is the Library of Congress control number, and it's a unique identifier for a newspaper title during a particular period of its life cycle. An LCCN may change when the title changes even slightly, when the publisher changes, or with certain minor changes like a change in location. Finding and using the correct LCCN from the beginning of your process is crucial. This can be challenging because historic newspapers are notorious for changing titles and publishers. It's not uncommon at all to choose what you think is a single title, only to find out that it has changed LCCNs five or more times, just over the course of its public domain life. These multiple LCCNs are often referred to as title families. As you evaluate the film, you may find multiple LCCNs of the same title within a reel across multiple reels, or even multiple years. So it can be hard to sort out, and this is another good reason to collate your film in advance. In fact, when you choose a title to digitize, you might examine its record before you evaluate the film, because what you learn from the record could change your mind about the title or the title family. So now you're asking, okay, I get the LCCN, but how will I know if there are multiple titles for any one newspaper? The Chronicling America Newspaper Database is a brilliant tool for this. 
chances are it will have 99.9% .9 of the records you're looking for. What's great about it, as opposed to most local OPACs, is that it will link you directly to related title records. They may not be preceding or succeeding titles, like those found in the 780 and 785 fields, but they're related in some other way, horizontally, and found in the 775 field. It's not enough to know that a title has multiple LCCNs. You'll need to know the precise date for when one LCCN started and the other stopped. If you're lucky, a record will have a 362 field, and that gives a start and end publication date. If not, sometimes the 260C field gives start and end years. At the very least, the 500 field will tell you which issue was used to create the record, and from that, along with other title records, you should be able to narrow down the exact dates. And exact dates are very important to know because, historically speaking, when titles were microfilmed, they weren't separated onto different reels by their LCCN. Nor do they have targets that say the following issues are from this LCCN and the last issues were from this LCCN. Microfilming doesn't work like that. A number of LCCNs were probably filmed together if they appeared to be the same title. One final note about MARC records. Make sure you use the record for print, not microfilm. Occasionally, one will run across a record created specifically for the microfilm. NDNP prefers to use the LCCN for print, which will have a different LCCN than the microfilm record. You can learn more about newspaper cataloging rules in the Newspaper Cataloging and Union Listing Manual and in AACR2. If a title you choose has content on a miscellaneous reel, evaluate the whole reel, not just the title you're after. You might be surprised by what you find. Unknown titles have been discovered this way. Microfilm shops make every effort to inventory what's on each reel, but sometimes a title just slips through the cracks for whatever reason. Even if you don't make such a discovery, you might find other titles that strike your fancy, which you may not have considered otherwise. Miscellaneous reels can bring a wealth of hidden treasure. Evaluate them as such. Now let's say you find one of these previously unknown titles. In the off chance that it doesn't appear in Chronicling America, Look to your local OPAC. If you don't find a record there, then the title may not have a record. And this could happen, and it has happened a number of times in the NDNP. Missing a record won't prevent digitization for NDNP, but you will need to make arrangements with the Library of Congress prior to digitization. They will guide you through the non-record process, and it's painless. I promise. I've been through it several times. Historic newspapers can be a little tricky, so slow down, pay attention, and always remember, don't panic.